my guest today is John Thompson, and he wrote a book recently, I think it's your most recent book, called Deliverance, A Journey Towards the Unexpected. And John is the uh, senior pastor of Sanctus Church just outside of Toronto, Ontario. Welcome, John. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to hang out with you today. How are things up in Toronto right now? Well, uh, it's it's we live in a very different world than y'all down there. Uh, so we are just now, it was just announced an hour ago that every mandate that we've lived through will be disappearing March 21st for the first time. We only got 100% capacity in churches with masks last week. And so we're in a very different world uh, than well, we have very different starting points as nations. Let's just say that. That's that's the Canadian way of saying we're not going to have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're your neighbors down here in Michigan. Yep. And uh, so we're watching you on the other side of the Ambassador Bridge. But yes. uh, uh, it, uh, love Canada, love Toronto. Toronto's a fantastic city. Awesome. Very multicultural, uh, melting pot, very cosmopolitan city. And a lot also of people has a history know. of... It's the fourth largest city in North America now, and it's the most multicultural oh, really? city on earth. Yeah, it's the, it is. There are 300 heart languages spoken here every day. And unlike the American experience, which is melting pot, we are multicultural. So people retain their ethnicity and their distinctions first and then are Canadian second. So this is like a really wild, cool city, especially if you love culture, art, food. And it also is a really interesting place to be a Christian. <laughs> well, I know the food scene is really strong. It's epic uh, up in Toronto. Uh, yeah, it's I miss epic. being up there. It's been a couple. It's been a long couple of years, I'm sure, for you. Yeah, and uh, and we celebrate with you and uh, and the fact that those mandates are uh, lightning and praying yeah. that the church really is strengthened and rebounds as a result of that. But have you guys? How long have you been meeting in person? Uh, it depends on what site. Uh, I. I that we actually were meeting and then we lost it and then we were meeting and then we lost it again. I think we've had four different closures over the two year period. So I, I honestly can't even remember when it started again. It's just, it's been up and down and all around. It's been wild. Yeah. Yeah. It's been like the way I say it is that leading uh, a church through the COVID era is like whitewater rafting. It's like, you know, the water's calm, then all of a sudden you hear the sound of waterfalls, and it's like, tuck your legs, lean in, and paddle hard. And uh, if, you, if you've if you led through the last two years of a church, you've led through a decade, really. Oh, I mean... Yeah, yeah, at least. Well, we were. I was saying, actually, uh, in another context, uh, a lot of people have thought about this, but this is the first moment globally that every human being has been touched since World War II. And, uh, and it's just, there's it's just a very interesting thing about it. like, I'm 46. So I, I have memory of my grandparents, World War II, the depression, but everyone under me has no institutional memory or connection to people who lived through a moment where the government interfered at this level, or there was a global event. 9-11 was not even a global event like this, like this, this was different. So yeah, it's, it's um, fascinating. That's, uh, that's one word for it. There are other. Words. I can think of a lot of others too, but we'll stick with fascinating. That's good. That's good. Uh, I'll take that. Now, John, this is our first time really having a conversation ever meeting, and uh, so I thanked you ahead of time. But I want to also go on record as just thanking you for this book because this, in my opinion, is touching on a on a subject and a very very big subject in the Gospels, but a subject that's not taught exhaustively or very clearly in today's world. There's a lot of other things that I think are taught, but this book, someone, so a friend of mine recommended it. Um, I was at a thing out on the West Coast with uh, John Mark Comer and then a friend of mine, John Tyson. And yep. Tyson's the one that recommended this book. He said, as only he can, mate, you got to read this book. So uh, <laughs> I ordered it, read it, uh, in about two days, <clears throat> and it so impacted me that I bought, I think, one for our entire pastoral staff and then sent a copy to – we have a, a bunch of churches around the country. So I sent a copy to every pastor in our family of churches. I don't, I don't do that often, but I feel like this is a really well done – you've done a great job uh, theologically and also pastorally – 
uh, laying out a, a case for the, the ministry of deliverance and what that means. And we'll get into that more in a minute. But I think you've struck a, a great note with both the pastoral and the theological aspects really marrying well in this book. And that's rare. A lot of times it's one or the other. It's very practical, not very theologically uh, robust, or it's really high academic level and not really practically played out. Um, so anyways, just wanted to say that just beautiful book. And I've uh, got a bunch of questions I want to ask you related to the, the subject of deliverance, casting demons out, spiritual warfare, all that kind of thing. But first thing I would love for you to do is just take a few minutes and uh, tell everybody who may not know you or your story how you ended up pastoring Sanctus Church in Toronto and how this has become such a big part of the culture and the ministry that God has given to you there in Toronto. Yeah, sure. So I'm a fifth generation Christian. Um, I actually am a missionary kid. I grew up in Ecuador in the eighties pre-internet. So, you know, I had the last, I call it the last national geographic experience before everything went global. Uh, And, um, and, and I was, I became a Christian through a Sunday school teacher and my mother in 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 a traditional Baptist church. I have no charismatic upbringing, even overseas at all. Uh, I'm a third culture kid. I've been to 40 countries. I've traveled the world. Um, and, um, yeah, just other things, married, three kids, only child. Oh, I won't give you my Enneagram nut number or what, but anyway. <laughs> oh, come um, on. But, We're all dying I'm to an, know. I'm an eight. Are you shocked? Are you shocked? Okay. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Challenger. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, uh, to, to me, all of this emerged organically. I was in a conservative uh, the translation for Americans, an evangelical freestyle traditional church that was Willow influenced. Uh, in my first book, uh, Convergence, I talk about how my, the, the senior pastor that I took over from, I was youth pastor. He was a business guy who got saved. He was entrepreneurial, grew the church from 50 to 1,000, which, by the way, in a Canadian context is is gargantuan because yeah, that's just huge. in scope. And, you know, he was willow, topical, and I, I was... Um, more reformed, but not angry. I was expository based, but didn't understand that. I I was contemplative in the sense I I knew the disciplines mattered and I knew that the Holy Spirit and the gifts mattered and I didn't have context for it. And it was in youth ministry. And actually in that part of time, we weren't even very multicultural. um, And all these spiritual experiences started happening that I had no categories for. I, I mean, I'd read a lot. I globally traveled. So I probably a little bit more than most. And so dealing with the demonic actually became the moment where we had to wrestle down even gifts because as we dealt with the demonic and what's mental illness, what's demonic, what's physical, what's exaggeration, that all on the ground, unexpectedly not invited. We, we hated the conversation. That was the weird church down the street that in heaven, we'd hang out with them. And other than that, we wanted nothing to do with them. And, and as the pastoral issues came that happened. And then in those moments, these other experiences happened, which of course, now later we understand were gifts. We didn't have right category for them. So actually it was the encounter with the demonic that actually forced us the uncomfortable moment, which forced us to understand gift orientation, which forced us to do definitions of gifts, which in the end actually brought renewal to the whole church because we actually took our church uh, in a very systematic way. And now it's totally incorporated through everything we do on why gifts are fundamental because Jesus used them, which is a whole nother conversation. But but that's sort of the journey. And now, you know, uh, probably a thousand cases later, uh, We've dealt with this, and I mean, we've just actually paused the, uh, this ministry again because of COVID. Some staff transitions, we have to rebuild again. So this will be the fourth iteration of how deliverance happens in a large church. And I just want to say to everyone listening, just because we always need to say this, because we all experience this. It's not greener grass here. There's all sorts of trouble here. We're trying to survive here. We've got all sorts of mistakes we're making here. Like, you know, just I just want to say that because. Anyway, yeah, that's that's good, and that's beautiful to say, because you're right. You know, you can you can look at someone who's written a book or seems to have something uh, established and think, oh, you know, it's smooth sailing. But I would think, especially in a context, um, we're a charismatic church. Uh, unashamedly, uh, we we actually use the language spirit and truth. That's kind of how we shape our 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 family. But I think. When you begin to step into the realm 
of dealing with and very head on dealing with the demonic or dealing with people that are um, engaged in power encounters, those types of things, things can get messy because people are going to make mistakes. People are going to make assumptions. And, you know, as you well known and well document, you know, the devil and demons are very real things. They have not taken a break. They're as engaged and involved in the world you and I live in as they were in the first century. And uh, that's that's a great, um, great reminder for all of us that we're, you're doing it, you're doing the stuff, as John Wimber would say, you're doing the stuff, but uh, it comes with messes and it comes with tests as well. Uh, John, you and I both know that one of the major, and you write about it actually, one of the major, I would say even theological debates that's gone on within the evangelical slash neo-Pentecostal, third wave, charismatic world has been the, the issue over, can Christians be demon-possessed uh, or demonized? Uh, on the evangelical side of things, typically the answer to that, if they even believe in uh, to present-day demonization or possession in anybody, their typical response to that is, no, the a devil or demons can't cohabitate in a place. And you know the Bible says our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Once you're saved, you're free. That's it. Curse has been broke off. In the charismatic world, guys like Derek Prince and, and others that were part of the charismatic renewal talked more about in, in very free ways. No, you know, Christians can't be demon possessed and they need deliverance. And I think in sometimes past that may have led to even some excess that caused even people within the charismatic world to kind of shift the pendulum to where I think presently it's possible for a lot of charismatic guys to say on paper, yeah, we believe it, but practically there's no actual functioning in that. So I want to ask you the question. It's kind of a T-ball because I know you go in this in the book. Talk about the idea. Maybe give us a definition of demonization or demon possession and then talk about how that plays even with Christian, non-Christian, or the in-between. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> All right. Uh, first thing as we get going in this um, – I'm, I'm going to take this maybe in a different direction and get there, like I do in the book, if you don't mind, because yep. um, there's a lot of straw man arguments. There's a lot of emotional reaction. And we I just want us just to know, no matter who's listening, just love everyone to calm down and just let's take this slow. Number one, I'm I'm a Calvinist. <laughs> so so let, let me work it out. Like some people are like, I'm out. That's it. He just, but I'm not angry. So it's okay, guys. I hug. Uh, I've, I've He's never a friendly been young. Calvinist. Yeah, I am. I've never been young, yet restless and reformed. Never, never been one of those guys. Okay. So let me work it out like this. My favorite book uh, is Ephesians. And so I'm going to address uh, this issue in three different ways. Uh, number one, Ephesians chapter one is a fundamental text about Christian identity rooted in the work of the Trinity. So if Ephesians chapter one says that, however you work it out, you're predestined and you're chosen and you're adopted. It also says that you're forgiven, you're redeemed. And then we all know near the end, it says, and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And so you have God, the Father's calling, you have the application of Jesus's work, and you actually are possessed, sealed until the day of redemption. So yeah, fundamental. And that's core to Christian identity. It's core to our soteriology. It's core to all sorts of amazing things. Chapter two says that because that is true, we're seated with Christ, not in the not in the heavens, actually in the heavenly realms where the where the ongoing war is taking place, which is really significant. And that is a positional statement. So the very first thing that I think everyone needs to understand is positional uh, statements are possessional statements. So uh, possession is positional. And this is really important that we catch this. Most people confuse upstairs and downstairs theology all the time. So the Bible is clear. Second Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the gospel that is the light of Jesus Christ or the, another version of that. So uh, it also says in 1 John that the whole world is under the power of the evil one. Uh, when Jesus is tempted in the, in the temptations, of course, uh, Satan has the right and offers the world, all the kingdoms to Jesus. So what we need to understand is there's only, you know, as the book of Revelation says, there's two marks, there's two cities, there's two communities, uh, no matter where your eschatology is. So the heart of it is every human being is currently possessed positionally right now. 
You're either owned by the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. You're either owned by the lamb or by the beast or the dragon, like you're owned. And so a lot of people get this argument about possession as something internal. And I just need to say, let's be biblical about this. Uh, possession, the possession conversation is upstairs first. You're either part of the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. Ephesians 2 is really clear about that. You once were this, owned by this, the spirit of the air, right? Following the ways. Right. Totally. So what most of us really have to wrestle out that, forget, is there something inside of me? Do I actually believe every non-Christian that's sincere, Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, uh, Baha'i, Sikh, atheist, agnostic, is positionally possessed by Satan right now? Most evangelicals mm. and charismatics would say no, but it's unbiblical. Mm. So Ephesians 1 shows us that our position is possessional and our possession is positional. Ephesians 2 reinforces that. Ephesians 3.10 says that the church, of course, is the ongoing billboard of Satan's defeat, right? Which is I incredible. Yeah. And I, I, love, I, love, I love that. Okay. So once we understand that there's only two communities of human beings in God's eyes, that's why, by the way, at the book of Revelation, at the end, there's the Lamb's Book of Life and the other book. There, there's only two destinies, two books, two communities, which, as a side note, would help a lot of Christians in their political discourse these days if they realized, in God's view, there's only two groups of humans. Just want to say that as a side note. Bonus. Another podcast, but I'll, I'll do that. Okay, so the question is, if that's true upstairs, what's the implication of the upstairs downstairs? And again, for those who are more theologically inclined, this is really important. Ephesians, uh, sorry, First Corinthians chapter one, verse one and two, where Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. Remember, the old translation says, to you who are saints, or to you who are holy, be holy. And the best way of saying this is bring your upstairs position downstairs into your everyday life. So to you that are already holy, hey, we'd really like you to be holy. But I thought I was holy. Well, you are, but now work it out down here. So that's the starting point that we need to. Now, if I might, we're going to go pre-cross to the cross and then post-cross. We, we good to do Let's this? Go. Let's okay. go. So um, the very first critical passage to think through, can a Christian have internal influence of the demonic? We'll get to some definitions in a minute. Starts in Luke 13. In Luke 13, you have a really uh, an epic moment where Jesus walks into a synagogue and a woman has a medical condition where she's bent over. I think it's for 18 years and cannot stand up. Now, again, just for our audience sake, this is important. Remember, Luke was what? <laughs> a medical doctor. That's right. Right. And so he actually, as he's recording this, uh, he actually is identifying a genuine medical condition, which is still talked about today. It's basically reverse hunchback where she could not stand up because she had a ball of bone at the bottom of the base of her spine. And I always do this when I have an extended conversation, especially with my more conservative friends. And I say, okay, so let's just, let's take what we say and let's see if we believe it. Uh, number one, uh, she's in church. She's in synagogue. I know it's free cross, but uh, you didn't. There's no such thing as seeker sensitivity 2,000 years ago in the synagogue system. If you're in the synagogue, you're invited and known, and you're part of the community. You don't get a latte and get a name tag and oh, I'm new. <laughs> like she is part of an appropriated group that is worshiping the true living God. Uh, second of all, I always say to my, especially my real and passionate New Testament friends, the Old Testament is as inspired as the New, right? They go, oh yeah, yeah. I said, so it's alive and active, right? Yeah, yeah. I said, okay. So she has she is choosing to sitting to sit under the living word of God in the community of faith, worshiping the true living God. Yeah. Okay. So our translation would be she's at church and she's sitting under good Bible preaching. Fine. Now she has a medical condition. The doctor and the the doctor identifies the medical condition. Jesus walks in and heals her. And in the middle of the healing actually identifies that the medical condition that is internal is demonically rooted. And so he lays hands on her. I believe he lays hands on her in that case. She straightens up. Uh, she becomes a Pentecostal and does a jig. And it's really exciting. And everyone's so excited. And then the pastor gets really pissed off and says, this is the wrong day to do this. And then Jesus turns around and says, you care more about donkeys than you do women. Now, here's the phrase. You care more about your donkey then you do this woman who is a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years. Yes. All right. 
Now, this is why this matters. And this is why I'm taking this slow. And since we got time on the podcast, we'll do this. She is the only woman in the whole Bible called the daughter of Abraham. No one else. And in Lucan theologies, because remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have theological intention. They're not just recording history. Right, right. It is, it is, it is, it is not a phrase of ethnicity. Oh, she's Jewish. It's not even a phrase of, oh, she's Jewish and in covenant. It's actually the Luke way of saying she's saved. Because when Zacchaeus, the wee little man, the wee little man was he, when, when he encounters Jesus and Jesus goes and has dinner, what does Jesus declare about him? Today, you've become a, a son of Abraham, even though he was what? Ethnically Jewish. So, so this is what's wild about Luke 13. This woman who has been past tense and is still a daughter of Abraham, meaning actually saved in right covenant in church under God's teaching every week has a medical condition that is internal, that is caused by Satan, even though she's in right relationship with Yahweh. And she's the only woman identified as saved through that phrase. Yeah, that's, that's great. So you go, okay, okay, okay. This, this, this messes with my mind. And then this brings the next thing up where Anyone who's an English speaker reading any of the New Testament translations, when you see the word possessed, when I say the word possessed and you say the word possessed, we as English speakers immediately go possession equals ownership. These are my glasses. So we go, I own those glasses. So every time we read in our English Bibles, possessed, we go, well, there's no way Satan could be in me because I can't be what? Owned by Satan. I'm owned by Jesus, Ephesians 1. But here's the wild thing. In New Testament Greek, the Greeks were so materialistic and so excited about owning things, they would have done very well in the North American ball, that they invented not one, not two, not three. They have five different words for owning things. One for Gucci, one for Louis Vuitton. Like They they were into owning things. So if they wanted to talk about possessing something, they used one of these five words. Here's the shocking thing. In New Testament Greek, None of those words are ever used when you see the word demon possessed. Never. The only thing that is used in original Greek is they had a demon. They were vexed by a demon. They were tormented. It was present. It never, ever. So when you read the word possession, you need to stop and go linguistically. That doesn't mean ownership. That just means they have. Why do you think the translators chose that? I, I just think be, because it's such a visceral experience of something being in you, that makes sense. But it's not actually. That's why possession means ownership. But the actual word that should be used, demonized, means to be have vexed or tormented. But it never has an ownership implication. Now, all my reform friends, which is probably only three of them on this podcast, but for <laughs> whoever y'all are, Or other people, I know what some people are going. They go, okay, that's very intriguing. I've never thought about that before. But John, that's all pre-cross. That's all pre-cross. So so that that doesn't count. Well, of course it counts, by the way. Paul is not elevated over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just remember, the Gospels were written after half of Paul's work. Side note, let's just be academically sound in our honesty. But deeper than that, if you trans, if you go into just pre-cross and then post-cross, so Peter says to Jesus, "Don't go die," and Jesus turns around to Peter and says, "Get behind me, Peter." No, he behind me. Satan, and the implication is that the origin, the idea, or the spoken word is not Peter. Yeah, it's demonic. Well, he says, you're not mindful of the things of God. You're mindful of the things of men. So so what's striking about that, again, is you have another moment where one who is in right relationship now with the Messiah is speaking on behalf of or influenced to the point of speaking on behalf of the devil. Okay, post-cross, um, in the book of Acts, there's these things I talk about in the book called Turf Wars. And it's every single time the gospel goes forward. Uh, there are these moments where there's spiritual conflict. The very first turf war that happens is inside the church. And Ananias and Sapphira are the great example because it's during a revival. I just, this is really important we hear this. It's during a revival. Thousands of people are becoming Christians. Baptism, actually hatred between uh, Gentile influenced Jews and Hebraic Jews is being reconciled, which is incredible. Barnabas sells his cottage 
and you're in Michigan on one of your lakes. Right, Lake Michigan for sure. Lake, yeah. yeah, he sells his cottage for a million bucks and gives it to church. And Ananias and Sapphira, we want to do this too. And we all know the story. And they, it's not wrong they sold the property. They just lied about the price. Ananias walks in. And by the way, you can't say he's not a Christian. There is no context where you can right. say Ananias and Sapphira are not in, in the genuine community of faith. And why I love this encounter is because it also helps us understand two spiritual gifts in a very articulate way. Peter looks at Ananias and says, why is, so sa- why is Satan so filled your heart, internal statement? Because you've lied about the price. So discernment and words of knowledge. The way we work it out up here is this. Discernment is about source. What okay. is the plug or the source yeah. of what's happening? It's not informational. A lot of charismatics, I think, make mistake and make it informational. It's the source. Is it God? Is it mental illness? Is it the tacos from last night? Is it is it the demonic? What's the source? That's discernment. Why Satan so filled your heart? The word of knowledge is because remember we say up here, words of knowledge is information you have no access to that bring healing or humility, but never humiliation. Right. That's good. Access, right? So a word of knowledge, Peter goes, you've lied about the price, word of knowledge, door opening event, (laughs) and Satan has now filled you and is trying to gain access, foothold into the community, and this ain't going to happen here. And we'll hang out with Ananias and Sapphira in heaven, but they become this holy example for holy fear for us. So that is a post-cross moment. Now, back to Ephesians real quick. Ephesians 1, predestined own dot bought, adopted. Ephesians 2, see with Christ in the heavenly realms positionally. Ephesians 3, the worst, most broken down, most dysfunctional, most I can't stand each other church on earth is still the living billboard of Satan's defeat, which (laughs) thank God. And then we know that's right because he's trying to build unity. And then chapter 3, 4, and 5 are husbands and wives, churches and leaders, slaves and masters. How does all that positional possession work out in unity? And in chapter 4, he suddenly stops and says, and oh, by the way, if you let anger ex, you know, go beyond the sunset moment, you'll give the devil a foothold. Now, that word in Greek is topos, T-O-P-O-S. It's used, I think, 83 times in the New Testament. 98.5% of the times are room, region, place, space, opportunity. So this is incredibly important. Post-cross written to, by the way, the church that's living in the heart of the New Age occultic center globally. And if you do any studies, by the way, if you go to Barnes & Noble, that's what your bookstores are called down there, right? We have different names. I think there's still a few and, left, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, or whatever they are, yeah. But if you go to a bookstore and you see the New Age section, the witchcraft section, the self-help section, 2,000 years ago, that would have been called the Ephesians section. Anything like that was called the Ephesians writings. So Paul's writing to a church in that environment, and he's already said, you're already predestined, saved, adopted, owned, seated in heavenly realms, and oh, by the way, uh, a billboard of Satan's defeat. If you habitually get involved in anger, you will give, even though you're predestined and positionally upstairs owned, you will give uh, the demonic uh, inside foothold. Foothold is not an external oppression. It's an internal statement of room or region, place or space. So this is critical because then then this helps us understand Ananias and Sapphira. This helps us understand that woman in Luke 13. Uh, This helps us understand a lot of stuff because this is saying that you are positionally possessed. You are saved because if you look at verse 30, it says, and do not grieve the spirit of God with whom you're sealed until the day of redemption. And I'm an eternal security guy. So I'm like, you're in, you're in, you're in. So it's done. So what he's saying is, It is possible to be predestined, be a brother of Jesus, be clean by his blood, be sealed until the day of redemption. But if through habitual sin, you don't understand what you're doing, you will open a left bedroom window and a demonic being, not evil in a, in a, in a metaphorical, a a demonic being will walk into your life, will not own you, but will have impact inside of you like a squatter that moves into a house it does not own and it destroys the room, but doesn't own the house. And the door opening event wasn't a Ouija board. It was an anger problem. 
Wow. Wow. And, and then people go, Oh, see, it's only anger. And I'm like, Oh no, come on guys. Be, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Lots let's be much things. more honest yeah. because he lists brawling and slander and laziness actually in that passage and all sorts of other things. And his point is in that place, you can be positionally great and you can be downstairs, not possessed, but demonized at the exact same time through habitual sin. Now, and, and that's, by the way, only one of the five acts that is a door opening event in scripture. But that's a critical thing. This, why this matters is because there are so many of us in churches who love Jesus, who read our Bibles, and we listen to Nikki Gumbel every day on the Bible app, or we're on version, or we do our best more Bible studies, or, you know, we're all in, and we go to Connect Group, and we take communion, and we serve on worship teams. But we have been told our whole life, it is impossible for the demonic to inhabitate me. And then we have no venue to talk about some stuff going inside. So maybe one last thought that you can ask me some more questions. Sorry, you just, I want to take so much time with this. Yep, do it. Spiritual conflict, there's three enemies, not one. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Our flesh is our human desire to break the Ten Commandments, to break God's law. It's actually to assault the creator because Sin is always has a God word force. God hates murder because he's a life giving God. God, you know, hates adultery because he's a covenant keeping God. So every single time we sin, it's an assault against our creator. So that spiritual conflict, right? How Paul says, I want to do the things that I don't. Yeah. World, when we see the word world, it's the, the age that fundamentally runs in different directions against the kingdom. And yeah. that can have a left view and a right view and a mixed view. So all three of these are our enemies. What's concerning to me, charismatics and evangelicals, historic Orthodox conservative people have elevated the evilness of Satan above the other two inappropriately. Hmm. So when I sin, and I've sinned in the last 24 hours, I wouldn't go, oh my goodness, I've lost my salvation. The spirit of God left because I sinned. I would never say to someone, well, the whole, you're not saved. How could you be, how could you be possessed by the spirit and sin? If I had a worldliness experience, I wouldn't say I've lost my salvation. I'd say the spirit's been grieved. So why do we think that the presence of the demonic is more evil than an assault against the creator or actually a functioning version of an evil kingdom? And the answer wow. is because we're uncomfortable. Well, and, and don't you stable. think that part of why we're uncomfortable with that has way more to do with Hollywood than it has to do with New Testament Christianity or the the inspired canon. I mean, you can't help but read it. One of the things you did really, I think, just beautifully in your book was you go through the Gospels, each of the Gospels and Acts, and, and you can't read through that and not see the the prevalence and the dominance of demonic influences at multiple different levels as well as spiritual warfare. But when we look at, especially in a Western context, American or you know Canadian culture, we share the same movies. You look at how Hollywood has depicted, like through The Exorcist or you know whatever you fill in the blank, whatever horror movie or supernatural book or movie that you come across, how they portray quote possession or demonic activity is vastly different, uh, both in power and in scope than what you read about in the New Testament. And if you don't have any experience in these type of things, you'll look at that and go, well, that's not me. You know, I'm not, my head's not spinning around and, you know, crosses aren't burning. Right. Well, well, absolutely. The other thing though is, it depends on how multicultural your city is. Um, And this is really important because most cultures around the world are just like, where are y'all been? We know this is all (laughs) true. In other words, um, we have functionally, as as again Orthodox historic confessional Christians, we have functionally act like atheists Correct. when it comes yep. to this conversation, and we have psychologized away all of the markers that the New Testament uses as a possible sign for the demonic, and yeah. and so this this is really important. There are very violent, weird uh, experiences yeah. sometimes, a hundred percent, and there are many people listening who they will go, well, actually, if you really heard what was going on in my mind, or if you didn't know actually what I'm tempted with, it is pretty bizarre and wild, and it scares me. And 
and there's help for that. But the other problem is we we just don't even let the scriptures speak. So like I did in the in in the book, I don't just deal with the gospels as recorded history. I use them as case study to see what you should expect right. when you deal with it. Well, right. that that changed so much for us uh, in our own context in my own walk when I realized what was taking place. Uh maybe if I can just address one other thing cuz I feel it lingering in someone's head yeah, somewhere in this podcast. Jump in. Someone's Jump in. someone's going to go like, "Hey, but Satan and God can't share the same space." And and they're drawing a box. And I'm just going to say, like, right. what Bible are you reading? Um, <laughs> Job chapter one, uh, Satan shared space with the living God. Now, you can say, well, that's no longer possible because of the right. work of Christ right. on the cross. That's fine. I'm just saying to you, the statement that God and Satan cannot be in the same environment is unbiblical. Jesus and Satan shared space in the temptations in the wilderness for an extended period of time. Um God is, from what I hear, omnipresent. Yeah. So God uh, actually imminent, perpetually yeah. um, sp- uh, has space. So you've got to stop thinking about uh, this as ownership. This has to do with grieving. Yeah. If through habitual sin, we let the demonic have access, think about there's a fire that exists. You have a struggle with lust, you have a struggle with stealing, you have a struggle with slander, still, you know, and it's your flesh. When the demonic move in, it's like they pour kerosene on an existing struggle and manifest it to such a way that it's almost unstoppable. And many people who are Christians, elders, pastors, leaders, worship, people you'd know about, they would say in their experience of uh, being saved but delivered, they would say that when the demonic left, they had the same struggle, but the intensity went from 110 to like a 52. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I've yeah. heard that from several people in the same way, and you know, I think, I, I think a lot of this. I know that Kraft was, you know, one of your uh, professors, and he's written extensively on worldviews, uh, the Western world, you know, Western secular or Western American uh, post Enlightenment view of yep. things versus a yep. supernatural worldview. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, there's a big part of this. It, touches on this subject, but a whole lot of other things where there are so many of us that don't even know how westernized, how much of a naturalistic foundation we have in our thinking that we only really put on our supernatural cap, you know, on Sundays when we go to church and sing about resurrection and angels and salvation. And, And we almost talk about it like it's myth as opposed to reality, but the rest of of our week, we've got churches full of people that are really living out the, the practically living out their faith, and it's shaped mostly by a naturalistic worldview. And that's really only true in the West. It's not true, like you said, in animistic cultures or Hindu cultures. I've been to India yeah. countless times, and I mean, they don't have one or two deities, and the lines between gods and demons are really blurred, and yeah. you know, supernatural is well, normal everywhere but here. Yeah, it, but interestingly, in this postmodern moment and in this deconstruction moment, lots of people are actually now reconnecting with their spiritual roots, but they're reconnecting with them in a pagan way. So one of the things that pastors are going to have to do in the next 20 years, especially in the States, like we're way beyond you. We're we're way down the post-Christian, de-Christian. We're actually emerging into a, a, a redawning paganism up here. Hmm. So our, you know, as I always keep saying to my American friends, you really want to know your future, come hang out in London, Toronto, not just in Seattle. You'll see what your future is going to be because it is coming. And what, what pastors are going to have to do is they're going to have to pivot between enlightenment thinking people, post-enlightenment thinking people, and pagan and I mean that in the traditional sense, uh, spiritual religious people. And actually, that's going to you're going to have to do ministry in three directions at once to to either introduce people to the reality or discover the true source of the reality or redirect the reality. And that's okay, why camp it's, right there for a second. So what is sure. it? What is what does that look like pastorally engaging with a uh, a pagan culture or an emerging new pagan? What's the difference? What's the nuance now that you're you're having yeah, so, to deal with. Yeah. So here's a great example. So I'm I'm currently preaching through the book of Revelation, not because I think it's the end of the world. We've been in the end times since Jesus said we were, which was when he was around. Um, but, uh, you know, when I preach, here's I'll, I'll literally at the end of a message say, okay, 
here's a great about the spirit of antichrist talked about it in first second third john not the antichrist and and i here's a classic phrase i uh, last week i said hindus speak in tongues and so do christians both experiences are genuine the question is what is the source hmm. that's how you speak to someone who's a supernaturalist you're not denying the experience. An enlightened person says you're all stupid, grow up and get some science. <laughs> Most Christians say that. What I'm saying is, no, I actually don't doubt you speak in tongues. My question is not that you speak in tongues. My question is, I, my role as a pastor is not to dismiss experience, as Paul taught us, as Jesus taught us, as Peter taught us, is to interpret the source of the experience. That's why pastors don't want to do this. Who's got the time? I got programs to run. And I'm like, well, the problem with that is we have these huge underground rivers of experiences in our churches and beyond our churches, and our role through spiritual gifts, spiritual disciplines, and other things, even just the knowledge of scripture, is to interpret experience. So to a pagan person, I don't, I'm not dismissive of the experience. I want them to see the source might not be what they think it is. For right. a Christian, I want them to outline, is the source Christian or not? And if it is, how is the growing character of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 13 actually informing how you use that experience? And then like, so that's what I mean by pivoting. It's not, it's like, in That's other good. words, you're, no. you need a John Lennox thinking person who defends the rationality of the theistic understanding of God at the same time as you're going to need social justice people at the same time you're going to need charismatics because actually all three of those venues, as I talked about in book one, word, power, and love gifts all become uh, apologetic doors into the same kingdom. And, and, and they, they tend to be in different churches and they tend to be different movements, but they should be incarnated in one church. And that takes a lot more work. <laughs> so uh, sim uh, helping people recognize that not everything that's spiritual is holy. Because I think there's a belief system, even in the church, and kind of a syncretistic yep. Oprah chicken soup for the soul type of way with Deepak yep. Chopra or whatever. It's like yep. we're yep. pulling anything in and saying, well, if it's spiritual, it's got to be good, right? But not recognizing the source. Correct. And so the so the again, one here's a great, just simplized, a simple test for people to think about. Uh, when we talk about spiritual gift orientation here, one of the things we always talk about on the power side of it is any spiritual gift you had pre-conversion is not from our side. And people are like, what do you mean? I said, well, it's very clear in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, uh, 4 that the spiritual gifts are endowments by the Holy Spirit under right. the ordination of Jesus. It's not a buffet. This is where I disagree with John good. Wimber. Yeah. Really I, I, good. You know, John Wimber used to say, here's my empty bucket. What do I get today? I'm like, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You're not an uh -huh. eye one day and a foot the next day and an ear the next day. That, that, right. that goes against interdependence that goes against accountability it violates all the subject matter gifts and and at its heart they come with the spirit so if you are not saved that means you're not possessed by the spirit of christ which means you don't have christ and if you don't have the spirit of christ you don't have the gift of christ so many many people who are more spiritualized or experiential say oh you know like i've always had this sense as before I was, you know, a Christian, I was yeah, knew someone's yeah. going to die, and now, and I'm like, not from our side, and they're like, oh, but see, and, I yeah. by, and I, but now I just call it prophecy, or I call it discernment, and I recategorize it uh, under the Christian name, and I'm like, the problem with that is the source of that existed pre-Christ in your life. Yeah. And, and then you're like, but then they're like, well, I can't, Satan can't be in me because I'm a Christian. I'm like, ah, but That's... actually he can. And, and so if I share a story, I was, I was, uh, I teach a, a seminary class in spiritual conflict here uh, in Toronto in a transdenominational seminary. And a guy came up to me, I'll never forget it, free Methodist, preparing for ministry. I had just done a version of this talk and he came up and he was a white guy, a Caucasian. Uh, but but he was like sheet white, like white, white, white. And I, I, I was like, are you sick? Are you okay? And he was like, um, he said, when you said that thing about gifts and he said, like, I'm really concerned. I said, why are you concerned? He said, well, I, he says, I, it's the wrong word, but I've always been sort of like a psych. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've always just known. And he listed all this stuff. And I said, when do you become a Christian? He told me, I said, well, uh, I said to him really quickly, I said, your mom and grandma have it too. And he's like, how do you know that? I said, we'll talk about that in a minute. I said, but um, do all three of you function in it? He said, yeah. And he said, I, I use it in my free Methodist church's prophecy. <laughs> and I said, it's not from our side. 
And then he said, but it's done good for the church. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Results have nothing to do with source. Right. That's so good. And so I said, do this. I want you to go. I don't doubt your salvation. I don't doubt your calling. I said, go before Jesus tonight, the Jesus and say, Jesus Christ, son of God, who sits at the right hand of the majesty of God, the Father. Say that Jesus, because there are many Jesuses, by the way, that Jesus, uh, ask him to remove the gift if it's not from him. The next day he came back and he said, I'm terrified. He said, I'm blind. It's gone. I said, praise God. Yeah. And he's like, do I have to go back and now tell my mom and my grandmother it's not of God? I said, you absolutely must. And and by the way, we both know free Methodist churches aren't the most like charismatic, yeah. let's go churches. That's, that's so rare. That, that's that's an example of source evaluation of gifts, yeah. but with a spiritual conflict lens. This is fascinating. In fact, I can already tell we're gonna we're gonna have to do a part two to this at some point down the road, John. Hopefully, you'll come back for that. But sure, I got to. two questions left that I want to ask you. Um, one, uh, both of them actually are really practical, <clears throat> outplaying, I think somewhat practical. One's, one's for the pastor. I'll get to that. The first question, though, is in light of so much of what you've covered and just really articulated so well, what are some of the things that, you know, the, a person who loves Jesus with all their heart. They've got upstairs positional, seated with Christ, saved, elect, the whole ball of wax. And they find themselves wrestling with the same controlling habits, thoughts, you know, manifestations in some cases. They've been told, you know, pretty much their whole Christian experience, their whole life, hey, you know, hey, you just got to renew your mind to this, or you've got to try harder, or this is a sanctification issue, which, you know, obviously that's a very real part of a believer's life. But what are some of the things you would say to an individual to look at themselves introspectively, or, or better yet, invite the Holy Spirit, that would be indicators in their lives that maybe there's something else going on that is influencing or controlling from the demonic realm? What are some of those indicators? Yeah, so the first thing I want to say is this to anyone who's listening, don't be afraid. Every time God shows up and does a profound thing, the very first an angel or a prophet or a person says is, do not be afraid. Um, so don't be afraid. The very first thing, being, thing that Adam and Eve did when they sinned is they hid and, and the demonic love hiddenness. <laughs> That's why um, uh, James four and James five are so critical in this. It's not the whole story, but it's part of it. You know, you know uh, when it says, you know, submit yourself, therefore God resist the devil, he will flee. But he also says in James five, confess your sins to each other, per, ask for elders to come. In other words, if I can say this it, here, right, this is a Catholic thing, not a cowboy thing. This idea that I get to do it with me and Jesus already shows you you're hiding. This is a community thing. This is this has to be done in community. There are five ways the demonic get involved, and maybe at another time when we maybe get back together and do this again, we can work it through. But just it's important we catch this. Um, habitual sin is one way they get in. Another way is sex, uh, bonding with someone else, because it says you know in, in Genesis it says the two will become one flesh. In the LXX, the the uh, Septuagint version, it says the two will share one psyche. Mm. And so when you are involved in lots of sexual activity, and many of us have diverse sexual histories, uh, that can become a moment of bonding and openness. This I, I'm doing this so people understand where the doors might even open. Right. Uh, right. Uh, the third the third is, is family agreement. And you might totally disagree with this, but the Bible is written to communities first and individuals second. And so many, many times in many cultures and many situations, I've been praying with people and something will show up and say, but I have a right to the family. I was invited into this family. I was invited into this ethnic group. I was invited into this tribal experience. So just because you don't believe in it is irrelevant. <laughs> this, this is war. <laughs> like this, this isn't a phony war. This is a real war. So uh, communal agreements that have nothing to do with you um, can have that. The fourth one is of, of heresy, false teaching, false experiences, Ouija boards, tarot cards, trying right. to tell the pregnancy of your child with a pin. That's that's witchcraft. I mean, that's divination, right? right? And the last one is trauma. 
Um, and again, you know, we're watching what's happening right now uh, on our feeds at every moment in Ukraine. And, and we would both go at this moment, there is no justice or fairness in war, right? Right, right. And I think what we need to understand as Christians, there is no fairness in war. Correct. So many people who have experienced a horrific trauma and something has actually been done against them and they were not responsible still can become like an opening moment because there's a huge gash in your soul. It's not cleaned out and bacteria get in. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not just, but it is part of living in a fallen, a depraved world. So the fir- first thing I'd say is as a Christian, are any of those doors open? That's just right. one of the questions asked. Number two, ask Jesus, is there something there? Like ask. And Have not because you ask not. Yeah. And, and and don't be afraid. He's a good shepherd. His father is a good father. The spirit of God is present in you. He's already conquered all this crap. And so to ask him doesn't mean the world's going to end. And the third thing is, if there is something there, then one of the things you need to do is just say, in community, by the way, with a trusted pastor, with a group of friends, just say, Holy Spirit, how did, how, how, how did this walk in? Whether I understood it or not. And I'm just giving you the brief stuff. I mean, no, we have up here worked very, very hard to make sure we care for people and we have a process and all of that stuff. But just in community say, oh man, you know, I didn't know that when I was five and I did Bloody Mary and I just thought it was a joke and it was, oh, shoot, like Lord, close that door. And, and to all the Baptists out there, um, you pray like a Baptist at the beginning, then you pray like a Pentecostal later. And this really is important <laughs> um, because, uh, Confession is, Lord, I'm sorry that uh, I've done this. I've been unforgiving. You can list anything. Close that door. You'll notice when Jesus dealt with the demonic, he never prayed. He commanded. And most conservatives pray about things, but never command things to leave. Most Pentecostals command things to leave, but never pray about door closing. You've got to close. So the image that Kraft, you know, Kraft was great. And him and I disagree on a ton of things, actually, which you write about in the book. But. But interestingly, his image of a hallway is the best one. Imagine there's a hallway and all these doors are open. There's, there's actually garbage in the hallway and rats eating. The co- act of confession in community closes the doors. The act of healing and confession sweeps up the garbage. And then you tell the rats to leave. If you don't get rid of the garbage and you don't close the doors, the rats just leave and come through another door. Wow, that's brilliant. I like that. So, so it's just a real simple way to say, you know, you... You need to become a Christian. That's the only way you can get set free. James 4, James 5 in community. And that's when you're Neil Anderson. That's when you're a Baptist. That's when you're a conservative, right. closing the doors. And then you say, you got you got to go. I mean, yeah. that's the, my goodness, the three and a half yeah, minutes. Yeah, that's the version. two minutes. Like but that's a starting point because I think there might be a lot of people that have never even considered the fact this might be demonic in its orientation. And Jesus wants them to have freedom. He came to set the captives free. And if you know, you can't set a captive free who doesn't know he's a captive. Right. Uh, and and just, I want to pastorally say this very strongly at this moment. Mental illness is real. Yeah. It is real. Oh, that's good. And not everything that is mental illness is demonic. There have been many cases where we've prayed with someone who has bipolarism, schizophrenia, uh, dissociative disorder, and a demonic present is, is actually, a uh, demonic being is present, but is not those things. And I just, I got to say to your community as you're listening, if you're on medication after this, you don't go off your medication, right? That's so you, good. You don't, you, you. you don't self-diagnose this at all. And, and I think one of the things we all want, we all want it to be demonic because if it's demonic, then it can go. And, and one of the big things that we've all got to understand is even if there's something demonic there and it leaves, you're still left with you. So your mental illness might not be healed until your resurrection. So slowly in community with people that care, you take this carefully. And if you're like, I don't know anyone, but you know, amazing thing is why don't you ask God to provide people? They might just come out of the woodwork. Right. That's, that's really good. A really good caution. Thank you for being pastoral in that regard. I appreciate that. Uh, last thing is this, and just in a couple of minutes, besides your book, which let me plug one more time, it's called Deliverance, A Journey towards the unexpected it every every one of the listeners really should get this and uh and take the time to really read through it it's just really it's really rich but besides your book if you're 
talking to pastors who right now are like going, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know where to start with this. Your your story of how you came to your model and how you function within community and God's really given you a, a voice in that arena. That took a long time. It's an and arduous you. journey. What would where what would be the starting point for a pastor who maybe has some experience or in some cases, no experience in this arena, what would be the starting point you would direct them to, to begin to explore this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a few things. And by the way, I'm Canadian. So self-promotion to me is like, it's like tooth, tooth pulling. It's just, <laughs> it's not in our nature. I apologize for you, you even showing my book. I feel totally uncomfortable. Um, that's the difference between an American culture and a Canadian culture right there. Wow. I, I just, but I, I but I, I just want to say this, um, and it's not self-promotion. Uh, one of the things you've got to, um, wrestle down is you've got to wrestle down your theology and your vocabulary, uh, before you wrestle down the praxis. You, you, you've got to take your time. And like, and like you said to me, the reason why I wrote this book is I, I wanted to theologically show biblically informed people how to be weird well <laughs> i love that right and 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 um we were talking earlier again i just i'm sorry it's not self-promotion but the very first book i wrote called convergence why jesus needs to be more than savior and lord in the postmodern world is the whole story of how our church implemented spiritual disciplines and gifts rooted in trinitarian theology and still having a protestant reformation worldview the reason why I want to talk about that is because actually that set up the whole conversation of how to do deliverance, because actually the whole worldview in the church actually had a different starting point where gifts were not a Sunday school conversation and gifts and disciplines were defined for the community. So you could actually start helping people in multiple ways. That's great. So, so again, my journey has been convergence was how do I theologically and then practically work out spirit. In other words, how am I a Calvinist and serve Anglican communion, preach like a Southern Baptist, but still do spiritual disciplines and spiritual gifts all in one church. The joke we always have is how, if Tim Keller and Andy Stanley and John Wimber and Dallas Willard planted a church together, uh, what would it look like? And we'd say, that's us. So the convergence conversation to me is actually the more significant conversation because it is the linguistic, theological, practical question about Jesus, Holy Spirit, gifts, disciplines, and discipleship. And then once that gets established, then you ask the question of how do I do this? In the last chapter in Deliverance, I talk about the three or four pillars that you should begin to install in a church environment to help someone through this process. But in a slow process, I'd ask some people to do the, the homework yeah. first. Okay. The, uh, yeah. So, so that you don't have to promote yourself, everybody who's listening should go get Convergence and Deliverance by John Thompson. It's worthwhile. It's, it's a great, they're, it's really rich, a lot of experience. I'm going to go and read Convergence, and then we're going we're gonna to schedule something to have you back on if you'll come. Yeah, I'd love to come back. Hey, thank you so much, John. Everybody, uh, John Thompson from Sanctus Church near Toronto, helping the body of Christ grow deeper and wider all at the same time in our understanding of Jesus's victory over darkness and our freedom that we can have. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. God bless you. Thank you again for joining us. Stick with us, subscribe to the podcast, and we'll see you again right here on Spirit and Truth.